Thank you so much for signing on to our webinar today and happy Earth Day. Today is all about giving back to this wonderful home, but for us and hopefully for you, every day is Earth Day. So today you are taking part in one of our nature education events and we at the Trust are so happy to host Michael for this webinar um, and we're so lucky that he's joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to do a land acknowledgement and I always ask that everyone please stay mindful of the importance of our commitments and responsibilities as a community. So if you can't see it yet, the land acknowledgement will appear. We would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Wandat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge the land we are on is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaties. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. We would also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nations as our closest Indigenous community. We acknowledge this land and the people because the first step to reconciliation is recognizing the existence of Indigenous people. A shared understanding of how our collective past brought us to where we are today will help us walk together into a better future. We give deep gratitude to Indigenous peoples of these lands who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. The Oak Ridge's Marine Land Trust endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. So I know we have a lot of people that um, come to a lot of our webinars, but I also have seen a lot of new names. So welcome. If you don't know what the Oak Ridge's Marine is, it is a really unique geological feature that was created 13,000 years ago during the Ice Age. It's important to us and to you because it's home not only to us, but to hundreds of rare and at-risk species. This is a map of the Oak Ridge's Moraine. Again, I'm sorry if you can't see it yet. Um, it stretches all the way from Caledon to Northumberland. I think it's about 160 kilometers uh, long, correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, it's very, very narrow. There's more about the Moraine that you may not know, including all the fantastic water features that are in the area. 90% of the Moraine is in private ownership, and that's partially where we come in as well. Um, we do secure land through many different ways, which I will talk about. If you don't know what a land trust is, um, a land trust basically, and what we do is, as a registered charity, is protect ecologically valuable land. We get help from governments, communities, and individual donations from people like you to hold and steward our properties. And the thing to know about what we do is that when we protect land, it is protected forever, for generations and generations. We are so happy to say that we have over 4,400 acres across 60 properties protected, um, and we're, of course, counting uh, or adding to that every year. We do have properties all across the Moraine, but we also have properties that are outside the Moraine. So if you can see the map here, you can see that this kind of shows you where some of them are, they're not super accurate, um, but it just gives you an idea of how far it's stretched. In terms of how we secure it, um, for example, dealing with the government or getting help from the government, one of the programs we use is the Ecological Gifts Program, and it federally protects land. So it doesn't just have our protection, it also has federal protection. It also gives landowners a chance to leave a legacy, but also get significant tax benefits um, when they donate their land or do a conservation easement. As you know, we also do outreach and education programs. We're sponsored by a lot of great people. Um, a lot of great organizations help us give out these or do these programs for free. Uh, and that's why you're getting this webinar today. We do walks, we do bio blitzes, citizen science things. So we hope that after being part of this webinar, you'll also be part of lots more once we can do it safely. In terms of upcoming things, we do have webinars um, scheduled for the next month. So we're doing an introduction to mushrooms and other fungi in the Moraine. Michael is also doing mammals of the Moraine, which will be so cool, we're looking forward to that. We're also doing one on moths. And after that, we're hoping to do more in-person events, but these most of these will be recorded so you can uh, re-watch them in the summertime. Okay, I am going to stop sharing and hand it over to Michael. Um, Michael, I just want to say before I go, uh, housekeeping rules. I usually say with this many people on a webinar that we keep all the questions in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat because sometimes in the chat questions get lost. 
So I hope you agree with that. And we tend to keep questions till the end. Um, but of course, you run it however feels best for you. That sounds fine with me. All right, take it away. Okay. Well, it's, I'm very honored to be speaking on behalf of the Land Trust because uh, what we need now in, in not just Ontario, but this world are more land trusts, more responsible people that are preserving what precious we have, little we have left. And so I'm really pleased to be able to, to uh, talk and perhaps arouse some support for the, for the organization. Okay, let's share my screen now. And I think I can do it this way. Oh, don't want that. Can you see my dragonflies? I see scheduling made easy. And then your PowerPoint's behind that, I think. Oh. There we go. Yeah. Oh, I just took that off. You can see it now? I can see it We're now. Good. We're good. Okay, excellent. All right. Okay. So this presentation is about dragonflies and damselflies. But that's a rather boring title. So I thought we could spice it up a little bit. And how about calling them flying dragons and damsels that cause distress? Because that is what these creatures are. They are remarkable flying uh, creatures that, uh, uh, that are not just beautiful, but very dynamic in their life history. And so I'll go through a little bit of that with you. Uh, first off, I find it interesting that in earlier days, um, there was very little interest in dragonflies. People love things that fly. And so birds certainly caught our attention. And with Roger Torrey Peterson's Field Guide to the Birds coming out in I think 1934 or so, that uh, sparked a great deal of interest. And birds, of course, are colorful as well. So things that fly and are colorful have really caught our attention over the years. And uh, for birds, of course, very good reason because as you're seeing now, many of the spring migrants are returning and uh, many more to come still. So color, and the ability to fly. Of course, with insects, certainly there are some groups that we've really been drawn to as well, and been publications has to identify them, and butterflies is the main one. Of course, butterflies fly, and they come in a great diversity of colors and forms. And so just like birds, they caught our interest, and therefore we have a plethora of information on not just how to identify them, but on their life histories. But for most of the years, I've been involved with natural history, which now spans six decades, um, dragonflies were ignored. And yet they're such an obvious part of our environment. We see large numbers of them. They fly and they occur in so many incredible colors both in terms of dragonflies and damselflies. But fortunately, over the last couple of decades, especially the last decade, uh, there's been a great interest in dragonflies and damselflies because they certainly do indicate to us the quality of our environment, especially the aquatic environments. And, uh, and now there's new field guides coming out all the time. It's so exciting. I wish I was 50 years younger and had all the books available today and wait till the next couple of years, like 10 years down the road, what's going to come out. But anyway, dragonflies are beautiful creatures and it's remarkable that there weren't field guides to dragonflies prior to the last couple of decades. And every color you can imagine, whether it's orange, like this orange bluette, or red like a meadowhawk, or blue like a slaty skimmer, you know, all the colors are there. So they're just as beautiful as our birds. How about a rainbow bluet? One of my favorite damselflies. It's remarkable, the rich variety of colors. So what exactly are damselflies? Uh, they belong to an order called Odonata, which simply means toothed ones. And uh, they're called toothed ones because they have these incredible mandibles and other mouth parts that have great teeth on them for shredding apart their prey because they are predatory animals. They don't eat plants, they eat living things. And uh, that goes whether it's a damselfly or a dragonfly. Now, in terms of differences, well, dragonflies are which means unequal wing. 
So their hind wings are different size and shape than the front wings are. And generally, uh, dragonflies have fairly heavy bodies, thick abdomens, and when they rest, their wings are straight out from the sides of their body. And boy, those wings are magnificent structures, aren't they? As you see on this calico pendant here. Damselflies, on the other hand, tend to have really thin bodies, and uh, the wings are generally held closed when they rest, but there is an exception, as we'll see. Their wings are exactly the same, hind and front wings. So zygoptera as a suborder means even wings. And generally damselflies, generally there's always exceptions to every rule in nature, uh, damselflies are much smaller than dragonflies are. So here's a plant that some of you are, you're watching may well know, it's called cow wheat. It's tiny, it's only a few millimeters in size, that flower. So it gives you an idea how small these damselflies are, 10 millimeters often or so in length. There's a, I love cow wheat, so I stick up close above it. Uh, another thing about damselflies is they are less obvious than dragonflies are. Damselflies tend to hide in the background, often in sedge-rich areas uh, and, uh, and river edges and the vegetation. So they're not quite as obvious, at least for many species, as are the dragonflies. And the eyes are a bit different too. The eyes of damselflies are well separated, as we can see here. And then there's spread wing. I mentioned there are exceptions. Well, spread wings don't hold their wings closed uh, at rest. They don't have them flat out either. They have them on an angle, so they're half open when they rest. Hence, they're called spread wings. But look at the eyes, widely separated uh, from, the, from each other. Well, in the case of most dragonflies, the eyes are huge and they are touching. And by the way, dragonflies and damselflies, as other insects, have compound eyes. Instead of having one individual eye, they have many components, up to 80,000 in a bigger dragonfly. Now, they don't see 80,000 images. <laughs> uh, uh, they see one consolidated image, but it's a very sharp image. And these are visual hunters. They don't use scent to track their prey down as a coyote or a fox might do. Uh, they use uh, their eyesight. Hence, they tend to be daytime hunters but there's one exception we'll see later on. In terms of the dragonflies, there are some groups that are identifiable as a group. The darners, for example, are the big heavy dragonflies that we often see in huge swarms in late summer. And they have quite prominent markings on the thorax. And this allows us to identify them quite often just on the basis of what these markings look like. Well, the skimmers, very common group, you see commonly in the summer, especially around ponds. And this is one of the most common, the chalk-fronted corporal or the chalk-fronted skimmer. But like the other members of uh, other dragonflies, you know, very big body, very thick abdomen. Another subgroup uh, are the emeralds. And these are named for their incredible eye color, hence emerald. And there are a couple of very common species you'll encounter in your area, my area. Um, uh, one is the uh, um, um, uh, American emerald. And then this one is my favorite with the really narrow atom that swells out. It's the racket, racket tailed emerald. And look at the eyes on it. Now, I mentioned exceptions to every rule well, about the eyes making contact. This is not a damselfly, it's obviously a dragonfly. Big, heavy thorax, big abdomen, and large size. But look at the eyes, they're separated, not quite as widely as that of a damselfly. And certainly the body's not as frail, but it's, a, it's called a club tail. And the group has these eyes separate. So you can actually break down dragonflies to different groups and then go for identifying there. Look at the closer view of a, of a club tail. Dusky club tail in my case. I'm avoiding the names, by the way. I'll give you some names, but there's so many dragonflies and damselflies, more than 100 species in most areas of Ontario, except for the far north. And, uh, and I don't want to flood you with names, uh, but if you want to know some names afterwards, fine. Now, I mentioned they're visual hunters, both dragonflies and damselflies. And often, especially with dragonflies, 
they tend to have a favorite perch they hunt from. And when they fly off their perch to capture a prey and return to it, it allows us to take easy photographs, excellent photographs. Just find one of their perches, set up on it, uh, be rather cryptic, don't move around too much, and uh, usually it will return back to the same perch. And there's your picture. Or how about a Halloween pennant? Again, it's, you know, it's a grass blade, a gra grass flower that it's resting on. Or 12 spotted skimmer, turning its head to have a look at me. And what do they capture? Well, generally smaller insects. And everything is pretty well game for a dragonfly. Uh, this female um, has caught a moth here. I'm oh, sorry, a small butterfly. It's like a skipper. And uh, uh, this one's called a moth, one of the club tails. They go for flies as well. That's a, that was a crane fly that this spread wing has captured. And the smaller da uh, damsel flies, Eastern Forktail, one of my favorites, has caught a small fly here, you can see. And a small moth and so on. It's a little range of size of prey. Of course, the larger the, the dragonfly or damselfly, the larger the prey it will take. And they've got a habit of catching a lot of flies, including deer flies. Uh, so, uh, you know, those pesky flies in late summer that often bite you on top of the head and swarm around your head and buzz you? Uh, well, dragonflies uh, will uh, take them. They like this eastern pond hawk. Actually, I showed the female earlier, didn't mention the name pond hawk, but there we have it. So, things like horse flies and deer flies are fair game, as are stable flies, as are butterflies and moths. Mosquitoes, not so much. And uh, certainly, I don't think any dragonfly would bother taking a black fly because they're so tiny. But uh, they'll soon be out, and maybe they're out already in the moraine region. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, most dragonflies and damselflies ignore black flies. Dragonflies and damselflies, well, especially dragonflies, are masters of the air. And they've been around for a long, long time, and in medieval times, they weren't actually looked upon with much favor. Uh, there are a lot of myths about dragonflies, and they were used to terrify children, to make them shut up at night, apparently. Um, some of the stories involved, they would sew up your lips or your eyes if you're noisy or bad. And so all these vernacular names, mosquito hawk, needle snake, doctor, witch doctor, devil's horse, ear sewer, devil's darning needle, eye stitcher, and so on. And uh, of course, today we wouldn't be allowed to make our children behave by, by, by telling them that these things would sew their eyes up. You wouldn't want to. We want our children to respect and enjoy dragonflies and damselflies, not to fear them. Now, they have been around for a long, long, long time. In fact, dragonflies first appeared in the scene way back over 300 million years ago. And more recently, the damselflies emerged, not that much, but about 280 or so million years ago. And when did humans appear in the scene? Way up here. So in terms of their time on this planet, which is a very special day, of course, for the planet today being Earth Day, uh, we've been here for a speck of time, and we've done so much to service in a short time. Well, while these creatures have done nothing but eat and enjoy life and provide food for other animals all those years, we should follow their example. Um, anyway, so they've been around for a long, long time. And what's remarkable, when the first dragonflies emerged, we have fossils of them, there is so little change in their body plan over all these millions of years. So here's a prehistoric uh, dragonfly in limestone. And here's a current one. You know, so little difference indeed. The wings are very similar to ancient dragonflies. And the veins that give them support, of course, also allow for color patterns to appear. And uh, the wings of dragonflies are excellent because it gives a chance to, to identify different species based on their wing coloration and also the patterns of veins in their wings. When I first lo started looking at dragonflies back in the early 80s, 
only books that were, I think, Walk Old Nates of Canada, Alaska, I think it was called. And you had to key them out by the venation and their wings. Ignoring the color patterns that are so obvious, they were described later, but to identify a dragonfly to a species or a damselfly, you had to wing venation. It was so tedious, and perhaps that's one reason people didn't look at them very much. But look at these patterns, you know, female uh, calico pennant. And not I'm just... Like both part. Yep. Sorry Hello? to interrupt your flow. I just, we, we've just been noticing that you're cutting in and out and we're missing a bit of information. Do you think you oh, can no. try putting your camera off? Sometimes that helps with the connection a bit. Sorry, putting my camera off? Yeah, turning the camera off. I find that helps me with my voice coming oh, through I'm clearer. So sure. I, I've never had this problem before. I've got to it's, figure out how to turn what? my camera off now. If you can't, you You're can't. It's all too. right. I don't want to waste too much time. I just thought I'd ask. No, okay. How do I go about doing that? Has, um, okay, so what I see is my screen. So I should off, off my screen then? Is that what I should do? Yeah, I mean, if you can go to the menu um, of your Zoom um, yeah, so application. That, my, okay, so I'm on my full screen now, so I should escape it, I guess. But again, if it's if it's too much hassle, don't worry about it. I don't want to. Well, <laughs> I don't want to ruin your presentation. Figure this out. I don't know how to do this. Um, well, don't don't worry about it then. I'm sure it's fine, and and no one said anything. So you. Well, I don't. I don't, I don't want people not to hear the information, um, but I really don't know how to get back to the menu again. Okay, maybe here we are. Okay, if I do this and or if you stop sharing for a second yeah yeah stop sharing video um stop video but if, stop, uh, that's, but if i stop video, i don't want to stop video do, stop, i know well if you uh up? your video will just be your webcam and then you can still share your screen i don't i don't understand that so stop video you're saying if you if you see a button that says stop video, try to press that for me. Okay. I, I, no, okay. You should lose yeah. me then. No, we can still hear you. We just don't see your face anymore, but we can see the screen and we can hear you. So that's perfect. Okay. I'll go back up here again. Can you see my screen still? The dragonflies? We can. Okay. Yeah, it's just a little slow. There we go. So it may or may not help, but at least we're giving it a try. Okay, so you can see this now? Yeah. And you can hear me? Okay. And I can hear so, you. So what I was yeah, saying was, uh, okay, great. Okay. So the incredible patterns on the wings of dragonflies not only allow us to identify uh, species, but also sometimes the sexes, because there is, just as we have in birds, uh, variation between males and females in many species. For example, here's a really common local species, common white tail. That's the male. Same for the eastern pond hawk. There's the male eating a, a deer fly, and there's the female. The same goes for uh, damselflies. This is the larger of our damselflies, the ebony jewel wing, which is about the size of a, a small dragonfly. And that's the male with a beautiful ebony green body. But look at the wings, all black, female spot on their wings. And so the wing patterns uh, can allow us to identify males from females in many cases. That's so very important to, the, to uh, the individual species in terms of mating. They can recognize their own species. And the mating of dragonflies is a remarkable thing to watch. Now, just a second, I'm seeing unstable uh, connection. Britta, can you check the Wi-Fi because is it plugged in? Because it's, it says my uh, screen is unstable. What's in there, right? Oh, shoot. Okay. No, I'm losing my connection We can't here. still hear uh, and see your screen. 
Okay, uh, we're doing something here in the background because it says my 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 fi is about to die, and so we're going to get it plugged in here so you can carry on. So I'll carry on. If you lose me, you can you know probably phone me to say to say you can't uh, hear me anymore. Okay. So um, anyway, the mating of uh, dragonflies and damselflies is remarkable. The males, in addition to looking different in many species also are different in terms of structure. And at the back end of the abdomen, they have these incredible tools called claspers. And there are two pairs of claspers, upper and lower, and they vary from species to species by their shape. So this is some of the club tails, beautiful. Look at this, like harpoons. All different shapes. And again, you can identify similar looking species uh, by the shapes of the claspers. So another clue for identifying them. Now, claspers may appear to be what they, they mate with, but they're not. The actual mating apparatus is down here. The genitalia of a dragonfly is at the uh, base of the abdomen here. And that's another feature that comes in all different shapes and configurations. And these are often really bizarre looking. And, uh, 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 and again, in some really similar species, the shape of the genitalia can be used. It's not really a, a, a perverted thing to do, but use a hand lens and look at a dragonfly's genitalia and it'll show you a lot and reveal the identity sometimes. Sounds kind of kinky, but no, it's quite normal. But look at the shape of some of these things. They are bizarre. Something you might find in you know, Madonna's closet or somewhere like that, but not a dragonfly. Now the typical mating position is a very unusual one. It's called the wheel. And here we've got beautiful Cro-Magrion uh, uh, mating. Um, the male is here and the female is here. So you can see where the male's genitalia is. That's where the female attaches her uh, genitalia for sperm transfer. And while sperm is being transferred, look what's happening to the claspers. They're holding the female behind the head. And that's where the particular shapes come in because for each species, it's like a, a hand in a glove. It's a proper fit, lock and key sort of thing where only the right shape of genitalia can be used to fit in the female to hold her during the mating process. And just prior to this happening, when the male's uh, not attached to the female, he'll curl up his, his uh, abdomen up to here because the sperm is actually produced down here, but it gets transferred from where the male produces the sperm to the genitalia, here to this holding chamber. So when they actually mate then, the sperm is transferred from here, not from where it's produced way down here. So this wheel is unique to the Odonata and uh, it is an incredible thing to observe. Now, the first thing is when a male and a female uh, uh, agree to see each other, uh, the male will insert the claspers in the back of her head. If the female doesn't like how they work, she can reject them. And so there is some stimulation involved here as well. And here's a closer view of, of a, of a uh, in this case, a meadowhawk and the males claspers are in behind her head in special grooves. So after the female thinks it's okay, then she will start to bend. And don't forget the male's already transferred his sperm from down here up to the holding chamber. And here she goes. And then a mating occurs and uh, eggs are fertilized. So the wheel position is done by no other animals. Now, some of you younger people don't try this at home. You might end up in the hospital, but for dragonflies and damselflies, it's a very natural thing. But mistakes can be made, uh, rarely, but I photographed a, a pair of dragonflies here at one time. We were canoeing uh, near Kingston, and in the next canoe, these dragonflies landed on the lady's shoulder. And I paddled over to photograph, not her, but the dragonflies, because there were two species, a Halloween pennant, and look down here, one of the Sempentrum. So here's a case where the wrong species hooked together. And I, from what I could see, this female could not uh, uh, free herself from the process. How about this unusual thing? Here are three males 
all hooked together. So obviously mistakes can be made. And in that case, of course, there are no eggs produced. There's a female down here and two males like this. So this guy is not going to have any success at all, but this guy's uh, going to be okay. Now, sometimes there's courtship involved in dragonfly mating and damselfly mating. These are ebony jewel wings, and they do a beautiful wing display before mating. Remember the male has solid black wings, seen those white squares in hers? Well, the female, when actually what a male does, he actually flies over the female, and she will put her wings out flat saying no to him if she doesn't like his aerial display, or she'll clap her wings over her, her back to say, come visit me. And so she can reject or accept the male based on her wing posture. In this case, he's pretty optimistic, but she's already laying eggs. So she wouldn't have any part of him, uh, quite literally, and, and therefore nothing will happen. But if, if there is a male flying over, female claps yes like this, then he lands on her and he'll walk down to posi position himself so that he can carry on with the wheel position. Females have their own genitalia, and these are often modified for egg laying. In many species, the eggs are inserted into vegetation. And so here's a common green darner female sticking her abdomen down into the water, inserting her eggs into slits she's cutting with her little ovipositing tool, like a little knife blade. Other dragonflies will actually fly over and dip down to the water and either lay the egg in the mud at the bottom or just drop it in the water. Sometimes the pairs stay coupled together. These are the beautiful calico pennants, which are pretty small dragonflies. And what they do, they fly over bodies of water, even lakes, and they'll dip down in a split second and drop an egg in. And then you see the ovipositor here actually breaking the, the uh, current or breaking the water from hitting the egg. And they'll drop an egg and they'll fly up and do it somewhere else, and like a little sewing machine, but very erratic in terms of their movements. They will drop eggs in the water. There's a group called the basket tails, by the way, where the female has a basket at the end of her abdomen and all the eggs are in one basket, literally, and she drops a whole scoopful into the body of water. Even those uh, uh, odonates that lay their eggs in vegetation can stay coupled together as well. Here's a uh, violet uh, dancer. Beautiful, beautiful. Purple, unusual color in the animal world, isn't it? And there's the male and the female, of course. It's quite a bit different looking. Or here's a, um, another case where the female is inserting her egg. She's got a little, making a little slit in here. And, uh, and that's, it's a sedge sprite, by the way. And the male then is quite held vertically. It's really remarkable that they can held, hold themselves up uh, on the female's head while she's laying eggs. In this case, she's inserting in the species, inserting the, uh, uh, this is, these are spread wings, making a slit in the stem and laying the egg. When the egg hatches, the larvae will fall in the water. But in other cases, the female lays her egg right in the water on plants. For those of you who go canoeing, you see these beautiful swaying sedges in the water. Um, these are powdered dancers, and there's the female laying her egg. What's remarkable to me is when she's laying eggs like this, and there's current, all of a sudden the current can pull her under the water, and the male stays attached as he's doing this. In this case, she's almost gone, totally. And how about they both go down, <laughs> and they stay coupled together, and they come back up and carry on after they finish laying eggs. There are dangers to laying eggs in the water, and I've seen many cases, I shouldn't say many, I've seen a few cases where frogs are watching, and as the female is dropping egg in the water, the frog comes closer and closer, and sometimes gets lucky and captures the dragonfly. Or if it's a couple together, laying eggs in tandem, the, uh, the frog can grab the female, and the poor male goes up and down, not realizing he's lost his partner. After hatching, the nymph of the dragonfly or damselfly lives in the water for at least a year. Some species are longer, especially farther north. And as an aquatic nymph, they have gills in their abdomen and they breathe through those. And, uh, and eventually after the year is up for most species and the water temperature is at the right uh, uh, level, they climb up on nearby stems of plants 
or on the shore on rocks and or if they're on a cliff face they can up a cliff face depending upon the species and that's a remarkable transformation by the way the young have a remarkable mouth part with teeth on it that shoots out uh, about half an inch or so from the head and many are stationary predators who just sit there and they watch and when a small animal swims within the right focal point out comes this great structure and it grabs the the prey and pulls it inside to be munched up further as the nymphs crawl out uh, these have already lost their contents the back splits and the new dragonfly emerges now people often marvel at caterpillars you know they spin a cocoon and form a chrysalis if you're a monarch butterfly for example and after a number of days, out comes a flying a butterfly. People think that's a marvelous, incredible transformation. Well, to me, dragonflies and damselflies are even a greater transformation because uh, they go from an aquatic animal that breathes with gills to an air-breathing flying insect. To me, that's the most remarkable transformation, far exceeding what, what uh, butterflies and moths can do. Here you can see the breathing tubes that are attached to the body. And when they first come up, it's quite a sight. I'm sure many of you have watched this, but the skin splits on the back and the newly formed dragonfly starts coming out head first. And then it sits there for a little while. Notice how the wings are folded, but only temporarily as the fluid gets plumped into them, they spread apart. And eventually the dragonfly or damselfly can fly off and let the wings harden. It takes several days often for this to happen, for the, for the wings to harden. And during that stage, the so-called tenoral uh, dragonfly or damselfly is very vulnerable. And especially vulnerable when, as soon as they come out of the water. Once they fly off, they can hide somewhere. But when they come out, they are pursued relentlessly especially by birds and by the blackbirds, both common grackle as seen here and uh, red-winged blackbirds. They patrol the edge of lakes, rivers, beaver ponds, and so on. Here's a bog mat looking for newly emerged dragonflies to feed to their young or to feed to themselves. And a funny little story about this, by the way, I showed this slide at an entomological conference a couple of years ago. And, uh, and one of the entomologists yelled out, uh, Michael, that's a mayfly, not a, da a dragonfly. He saw this long thing here. And then several prominent uh, uh, entomologists echoed the same thing. One even gave it a name. And I was devastated because I can tell a dragonfly from a damselfly and I couldn't figure out what they were seeing. When I analyzed the photograph later that night, after consuming a lot of, a lot of scotch to, to take away the pain of being embarrassed, I looked at this carefully and they saw an optical illusion this is a grass, or sorry, a sedge stem coming up here. The actual abdomen ends here. So the long tail they saw they thought was a mayfly was not. Plus the nymph cases here to all sorts of clues. So I was right. And the next morning there was a, a announcement made that I was correct, um, which is, you know, tough when you have a bunch of entomologists all saying that you're wrong. However, it's a dragonfly and, 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 and very blackbirds and grackles eat them. They can pluck the damn slides. Here's a pair that's obviously been in the, in the um, uh, loop, the, um, the, the wheel position that it picked off, female uh, red-winged blackbird. And here's a whole mouthful of things she's bringing back to the nest. And that looks like even like a nymph case right there as well. So uh, probably the fella just coming out of it. In the water, the nymphs face danger too, from larger insects and from small diving ducks like hooded mergansers that often live in the same habitat as many dragonflies do in terms of the nymph stage. And as adults, they face dangers. If they land on a flower, for example, there could be a crab spider there that'll grab it as this bluet has as had happened to it. Or here's a white face, one of the small dragonflies that this crab spider, the goldenrod crab spider, on a beautiful orchid, Calipogon has captured. Or it'd be spider webs. And spider silk is incredibly strong. Can you imagine a flying dragonfly? You know, a big bodied, strong flyer hitting the silk and not breaking it. 
And the other danger can come from other dragonflies because big dragonflies will eat smaller dragonflies. In this case, almost a bigger dragonfly is being consumed by a smaller club tail. Well, here's the old enjoying the meal pictures. And we even have one species that is main food is other dragonflies. And it's well named, it's called the dragon hunter. And it's a big, strong dragonfly with a huge thorax full of muscle, big, strong legs for holding its, its victims. And there can be smaller problems too. Well, this is intriguing. Many dragonflies, when they leave the water as a nymph, have passengers on the outside of the nymph case. These passengers climb onto the emerging dragonfly and start feeding on its blood. These are water mites, our nurse. And look at this. They're on one side only usually, and there can be large numbers of them, but they're feeding on the uh, inner fluids of this dragonfly while it's flying around doing its business. And when the dragonfly goes back to water to lay eggs or fly over the water, they'll drop off back in the water again. Just like birds, dragonflies and damselflies are habitat specific for the most part. For example, lakes that harbor loons and their young also harbor a certain set of odinates. Lake darners are big heavy darners. Here we have a princess basket tail. These are commonly found around lakes. Uh, large rivers can have their own uh, fauna. They can have uh, river cruisers, swift river cruiser here, beautiful, beautiful beast. This is a brotherly club tail, rather rare dragonfly in Ontario at the edge of the Ottawa River on some marble. There's a, sorry, I had this picture twice, there we are. Uh, then there are streams like this and streams have their own set of dragonflies and damselflies. Here's a stream cruiser. Uh, the ebony jewel wing loves these slow moving streams. You paddle through those and you, they flit along the banks as you move along. If there's a little more current, you get river jewel wings, which notice how only half the wing is black. We have stream uh, 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 damselflies, stream bluet. And these hover over the water and, and fly back and forth where there's a bit of current. Where there's more current, where there's riffles in the water, then you have often some of the club tails. This is the uh, um, gonfus rupunculensis, the, oh dear, a rusty a snake tail, rusty snake tail. I'm a little rusty on the names right now. It's been a long winter. <laughs> oh, one of my favorites. Look at the club tail on this. That's a zebra uh, um, um, snake tail. And it's, it likes faster flowing streams or small rivers and often near the riffles. And, and look at the beautiful, beautiful patterns and that massive swelling, this is a male, massive club at the end giving rise to the name club tail. The males often have the enlarged abdomen at the tip. And uh, sometimes they're so specific, it's not to their advantage. This is the uh, Mississippi River at Pakenham, and uh, there's a, an endangered dragonfly. They're not found in many spots in Ontario, but they like certain types of rapids. This is the rapids club tail. And often specificity is not a good thing. It may lead up to problems if the environment gets changed, which is happening, of course, in many waterways with dams and so on. Yeah. We have lots of uh, odinates in the sedge meadows. But not so many of the bigger dragonflies, there are some, but certainly uh, smaller dragonflies like the meadowhawks and many more types of damselflies. This is pro one of the better ways to find damselflies is to wade through a sedge meadow or at the shoreline of a river or lake where there's lots of uh, grass and sedges, and you may find the damselflies drifting down there, especially the number of the bluets or the spectacular Eastern Forktail. Then you have quiet waters like beaver ponds. Beavers create ponds for their own use to bring their food back and enjoy it. And also have water that went freeze to the bottom in winter. But in creating a pond, they create habitat for water plants, 
that fuel the appetites of moose. Moose come down to feed on water shield and water lilies for their sodium content. But those habitats are also great for dragonflies. And many skimmers have their life cycle take place inside a beaver pond. It's a female common white tail. There's even a, a dragonfly named after beaver ponds. The beaver pond a, a basket tail. Or how about the beaver pond club tail? A rather elusive species found in Algonquin Park. Then you find lots of odonates in cattail marshes that have inhabitants like great blue herons and, and American bitterns and that sort of thing. One species in particular loves resting on the lily pads, and that species is well named. It's called the lily pad club tail. If you ever see a club tail resting on water lily leaves, it's almost inevitably this species. Most species don't rest on the aquatic plants like this. And a giveaway besides a beautiful club at the end of a tail, making it a club tail and the separated eyes is the color of those eyes. Spectacular blue eyes. Reminds me of Frank Sinatra uh, on this uh, a beautiful uh, uh, lily pad club tail. And one of the more common dragonflies that seems very tolerant of warm waters and shallow waters is this uh, dot-tailed white face. And you often see them on any kind of small shallow bit of water where it's warm and resting on vegetation or on the plants at the edge. But the males have this wonderful spot here, hence the name dot-tailed white face. The white faces are a group of, of uh, small dragonflies. And uh, this one is the most tolerant of warmer water conditions. And perhaps of all the habitats, my favorite habitat for looking for odonates are these northern peatlands. This to me is very reminiscent of Tom Thompson's Northern River. I love these habitats to explore. Uh, bogs and fens have spectacular odonates. Spectacular plants too, like the sundews that are carnivorous. Spectacular orchids like Rose Pagonia, and they have the odonates. This is a bog sprite. There's also uh, a fen sprite uh, that has, uh, or sorry, sedge sprite, a similar species. This is, this is bog. Sedge sprites have some black markings here in the males, which bog sprites do not have. And uh, if you want to see a bog sprite, they're often at the very edge of the floating mat of vegetation that surrounds the water in, in a bog or a fen. Amber winged spread wings are in that habitat. Well, this one's resting on leather leaf. Our crimson ringed white face, again, the white face, crimson ringed, beautiful on a rose pagonia. Again, these are peatland dragonflies. And then we have, to me, the one of the most exciting ones. This dragonfly you will not find high in the air flying around, nor will you generally find it up high on top of plants. It's down low, and it is the smallest dragonfly in North America, second smallest in the world. It's the elfin skimmer, and they're tiny, they're the size of a bee, and they fly down below your knee height usually in those peatlands. The males have a beautiful bloom. They, when they first emerge, they're not quite this pale. This beautiful bloom called pruinosity develops. And the female looks just like a little bee or wasp, a good case of mimicry, where if a bird that's tried to eat a bee or wasp has learned they're bad, uh, it'll avoid this dry, little dragonfly. But these elfin skimmers are minute. And again, you do not see them high in the sky. They're down below your waistline, down slowly moving through the vegetation. Um, we even have dragonflies that fly at different times of day, dragonflies and damselflies. For example, as the sun just goes down below the horizon, out come evening bluets. These little tiny yellow damselflies start appearing on lake edges and larger ponds. And uh, this one's actually riding on a, a cast male flower of a white pine tree, using it as a little float flotation chamber. And uh, they're yellow and they come out in the evening, hence the name Evening uh, Bluet. Uh, Analagma is a group of bluets, Vesperum referring to the Vesper habits of this. And we even have 
a couple of the species of dragonflies in Ontario, and one was fairly recently discovered uh, here, um, that come out when the sun's totally gone, the night sky is upon us, out comes a night flying um, uh, 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 dragonflies. There are a couple of species uh, of these, and uh, the, this is uh, um, Nercodulia um, michaelia, I think it is. And uh, the, these, you know, obviously we use a light here to illuminate it, caught one, let one go. But to see these, you have to go looking for them often near rapids after the sun has set. They fly for a short period of time only. So even at night, for the first part at least, there are dragonflies flying. And we have migratory dragonflies. The common green darner, for example, will head to the eastern coast for the winter and return, or have generations of it that return. And then we have strays from farther south, like the Carolina saddlebags that hit southern Ontario. Or the beautiful painted skimmer. So that makes it, looking at dragonfly is very exciting. Just like birds, you can expect to find certain species in certain habitats. And then you look for the ones that are not normally found in our area, and you might get lucky and see one of these great strays. Whether it's a damselfly or a dragonfly, the odonates as a group are an exciting group to look at. They cover so many different habitats. They appear in so many different colors and forms and they dominate, they fly and they fly over the water. They fly high in the air. They can, we see swarms of dragonflies in late summer. They are everywhere in our environments. Some require a little extra looking to find them, but they are there. And because they appear in so many spectacular colors and forms, they are well worthy of our interest and they are indicators of water quality as well because part of their life is spent in water. So whether it's a dragonfly or damselfly, I hope you'll have a little more understanding of their complex lifestyles and appreciate more of their great beauty because the odonates as a group are certainly worth a closer look. And that's it. I hope you're able to hear me. That's the end of the presentation. And if I leave it now, I'm hoping that I'm still there. I think you will be. I can still hear you. Okay. And I can see you. Good. And you saw the images okay? Yeah, it actually, it sounded a lot better afterwards. Okay, good, good. Technology, I just... It can, it can help you or it can defeat you. But you know, well, so and you can, it let us down, but dragonflies and damselflies and nature in general never lets us down. So, you know, the, the real world out there is uh, something you can depend upon where the contrivances we have made often fail us dramatically. Yeah, we don't, we don't go with man-made, you know. We always expect things to go wrong when it's man-made, right? <laughs> Well, woman-made too, not just man-made, but woman-made. Oh, true. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, right. Well, thank you. We do have questions. Um, so I, I don't know how you prefer. Would you prefer me to read them out to you? That's probably the best thing, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, of course I don't mind. Um, so the first one is from Jennifer. It's a little bit long. Um, because I think she has some background information as well. So let me know if you need me to repeat anything. So she says, I live in Northumberland County, east of Durham. I had a magical experience several years ago when going out to dump my compost after a rain in the early evening, early in summer. The air around me was full of literally hundreds of dragonflies. I was so enthralled that I didn't notice anything about their characteristics, but I've always wondered. There was a pond nearby, would the rain have precipitated them hatching from their eggs in such large numbers? Okay, good question. Um, the rain does not really affect their, their development because the eggs hatch and the larvae, the nymph stage, spends a year in the water usually. When they emerge, it's usually based on water temperature. And that's why uh, we'll have like in early spring, for example, no dragonflies at all, just biting insects. And all of a sudden, there, there are basket tails everywhere. Dragonflies swarms them over fields and meadows. 
not because of rain, but because the water temperature hit, hit the right level for the nymph to complete this transformation internally and then climb out of the water and emerge. And often over several days, you'll have myriad dragonflies emerging out of the water. Now, if that swarm, and I sort of missed the first part, was that in late summer, the rain? Was it, does it say when it happened? It was early evening and early summer. Early summer, okay. Because what happens too, as your summer goes on, you see huge swarms of dragonflies, darners, the big darners, and often mixed groups, flying low to the ground toward late in the day. And when they're picking up ants, ants in the dispersal stage, you know, the wing stage. And uh, if you see along a gravel road, for example, swarms of dragonflies down low, they're hunting ants usually, because as the adults emerge to fly off and mate and start new colonies, that's when the dragonflies nail them. And Jennifer just added that it may have been late summer and it may have just been a memory. Well, late summer, what it may be in the rain may have initiated the, the, the uh, may, may, may have just been timing where the ants were in the dispersal stage already. If these dragonflies are flying low over the ground, then they're probably picking up more than likely ants. Okay, great. Um, and Denise is asking, the lines on the wings, are they just structural or vascular? Um, they are vascular initially because liquid is pumped into them to give the wing strength. But then I think once they're, once they're solid, then they're just simply uh, uh, support structures. Oh, interesting. Okay. And Janet is asking, how many species of dragonfly are migratory? Not very many. Uh, they're in the minority and, and only a very small number. The common, uh, common green darner is the best example of this. Um, so most of our dragonflies, unlike butterflies, are rather sedentary in terms of their life history. Um, so there aren't many migratory species. Okay, great. And Jennifer is asking a question for us, actually. Um, will it be recorded? All of our recorded webinars will be available on our website once they get posted, and we do send out the link to everyone who registered. So that question's for us. Um, and Janet is asking, does the night flying dragonfly um, fly on a dark night? <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> well, a little bit of poetry or riddle or something. Um, did they use light from the moon? Yeah, no, I've gone uh, looking for them and their flight time is brief. It's right after the sun's totally gone. And what's probably happening at that stage, there are certain groups of insects that have an aquatic stage also, like mayflies, for example, or caddisflies that are emerging. But they fly at a certain time, but only for, I can't say for sure if it's an hour or more, but there's not much longer than that. And so it's a brief window. And so whether there's moonlight or not, no, they, they have eyes that seem extremely good at picking up movement in the low light conditions. And um, there are a couple of species, there's a Stygian night flyer, Miracodulia yamaskensis, that's pretty common in some areas, but then there's others that are extremely rare, like, like the Michaelii. Um, but they don't fly long, and you have to be at these habitats right after the sun has set. Okay, um, and Troll is asking, I have a pond in my backyard. I get some dragonflies. Uh, I don't know if that was a proper word, but um, around in the summer. But what do I do to get them to stay in the pond? I don't know <laughs> if we'll need clarification on that. But. <laughs> a tough question, um, because the nymph lives in the pond, and in many species, once the adults emerge, they don't actually hang around the pond very much. Some species do, but other ones go off, like the basket tails, for example, and so on. And, and you find them then in different habitats. Um, in fact, there's one species that the elusive club tail that leaves rivers and flies into the canopy of the forest. And where it goes is unknown. It's like a big mystery uh, for that one. But to keep them around your pond, um, as long as the pond has the same water quality, like the same characteristics, as it has when they're laying their eggs in it, uh, you'll always have dragonflies there, but not maybe around the pond all the time, but certainly for laying their eggs in and, uh, and then leaving. But many species will lay their eggs in the water and the nymphs develop. And during the summer that the adults are flying, they stay around to hunt there as well. So ponds are a spectacular place to look for certain dragonflies, 
uh, and other habitats, the dragonflies do leave and go off hunting elsewhere. And that's why you see large numbers of dragonflies, especially in spring, the, say the, um, uh, some of the um, uh, um, um, come on brain, um, basket tails uh, off hunting in large numbers over fields, fairly far away from where they hatched as a nymph uh, uh, from the egg and then developed over a year as the nymph. Okay, cool. And <laughs> some comments here are fun. Um, so Janet says that they are the original drones. Yeah. Uh, that's always fun, yeah. And we we're getting comments about your photographs, your wonderful photographs, and people are wondering, are they all taken by you? Well, they are. I took off a, off the internet uh, the genitalia close-ups, but everything else is mine. So just the, uh, uh, yeah, of the, I think I showed 180 pictures of those. There's probably one, at least one that's not mine, but yeah, they're, they all are my, my photographs. Well, everyone is absolutely loving them. So, but I'm sure you know that. <laughs> well, I, I love looking at the organism and, and to me, a photograph People often say, what a beautiful photograph. And it's not a beautiful photograph. For the most part, it's a beautiful organism. And so these dragonflies and damselflies are living jewels. And if we photograph them, we want to capture as best possible their beauty. And that's just a matter of learning how to use the technology of a camera, which has become so much easier, like way back in the days of film and tripods, it was so much harder to get a, a reasonable dragonfly picture. And some are challenging still, like getting a dragonfly in flight. flight. I love challenges. And, uh, and so, yeah, so some of the photographs were difficult to achieve, but they're not beautiful photographs. They are beautiful dragonflies and beautiful damselflies. I like the way you describe that. We do have a few more. Uh, questions actual questions of comments um janet's back and she says or she asks do any species develop from egg to nymph to adult in one season maybe smaller species I, not that i know of. there may be other around the world possibly uh i don't know of any here that do uh in one season um which makes sense because here when we have these strong differences in, in, in our four seasons if you lay an egg in, say, early summer, and the nymph comes out in the fall, then how, you know, the temperatures may be wrong for mating, they may not survive with frost and so on. So I, I, I could well be wrong, but I think it's a full year minimum for all of our species. And then as you get farther north, you get some that take two years, even three years, apparently, uh, to, uh, to uh, transform from the uh, egg stage to the adult stage. Okay, great. And uh, you kind of mentioned this a little bit with the growing popularity of the Odonata, but um, yeah. how many species are native to Ontario? And then can you recommend a field guide for identification in Ontario? Yeah, there's a couple of good ones. Uh, I, I think the number now is over 160. It used to be 100 uh, below that, but uh, there's been new species done. Because of all the interest in Odonates, many more surveys have been done especially in Southern Ontario on the Grand River and spots like that, they're finding some really neat Southern species. So I think it's over 160 now in Ontario and uh, certainly many local areas have more than 100 species, uh, which is spectacular. Unlike birds, where you might have 300 species going through a migration or nesting in an area, you know, the numbers of dragonflies and damselflies are much smaller than that. And so it's a group you could learn fairly easy. And many of the species are so distinctly marked with colors and patterns that they are easy. Uh, some are much more challenging and mo most challenging of all are the female bluettes, those little damselflies, because to me, they all look the same. And I must admit that I tend to look at mostly the male damselflies, you know, and to, for identification because they're colorful and they're far easier. But uh, to look at them, to identify them, you can often do it through binoculars or a camera lens especially, or if you wanna capture one, use a soft net. And when you capture a dragonfly, you can hold it by the wings. And even though the wings are flat out on a dragonfly at rest, if you carefully fold them over its back and pinch them, that does not hurt the dragonfly. And you can look at it. You can look at the genitalia with the hand lens. You can you know, look at the markings on the thorax. You can take a picture of it. 
and then let it go. Put it on a you know a branch or a leaf or somewhere and let it sit there, but it'll fly off with no damage whatsoever. And uh, uh, that's the best way. If you can, if you have a very you know fl fast flying elusive dragonfly, you know especially if you're over a stream and you see these guys racing over the water, you wait out there and you do your best uh, to capture one and then let it go afterwards. Uh, but many do perch, and that makes it very easy to, uh, if they fly off the perch, they often come back to the same perch again. So you watch their behavior, and if you see a popular perch, you just sit up, you know, sit up closer to it and wait for the dragonfly to return and take a picture of it. All right, great. And we also had somebody else um, asking again about maybe a field guide recommendation, if you have one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, there's a couple of really good, well, also online now, there are all these incredible uh, aids like Bug Guide, where you have things identified. Um, iNaturalist, you put a picture of a dragonfly up, it can be identified for you almost instantly. But in terms of field guide, a couple of my favorites, the Algonquin Park uh, Guide to Dragonflies and Damselflies is small, extremely affordable, and it covers most species in southern and central Ontario. There are a few exceptions for the deep south of Ontario, but that's a really good little book. And then there's one by Paulson uh, to uh, Dragonflies and Damselflies of the East, I believe it's called. And it's a larger book and it's really good. And then for damselflies, I find the best book is done by a guy named Ed Lamb. It's Damselflies, I think it's called of the Northeast, but L-A-M-B is the author's name. It's a gem and it's just damselflies with beautiful illustrations and range maps for them. Um, so there's three books that I think are my go-to for the most part. Paulson's uh, Dragonflies of the North, of, I think it's called the Northeast or uh, Dragonflies of the East. I forget the exact title of it. Um, Paulson, P-A-U-L-S-O-N. And, uh, and then the Algonquin Park Field Guide to Dragonflies and Damselflies is superb. And, uh, and then lambs, uh, damselflies of the Northeast. I hope lamb does one to dragonflies because it would be a perfect set to have as well. But now there's so much online, it's unbelievable. And I naturalist, you put a picture up and you get identification right there. Okay, and we just have a few more. I guess you can decide how long <laughs> you take on them. Um, so she, Sheila is asking, what attracts dragonflies to landing on somebody? She's seen it happen so many times. Ah, good question. They like just sitting up high sometimes. And so just landing on a person is like landing on a big rock. Uh, what should I say? A big rock could be a small rock if you're a small person. But uh, no, they just like to have a perch that they can see around the area. And, and so it's not that we are attracting them in terms of our appearance. I would certainly scare them away if they ever saw me through one of the appearances or smells, uh, it's just a spot to land that's high and looks pretty solid for them. <laughs> okay, not not the most exciting answer, but <laughs> <laughs> realistic. <laughs> yeah. um, we have an anonymous question. Uh, last summer, over approximately one week, just about all the damselflies they saw were couples. Is there a specific trigger for mating to occur? Oh, that's a good question. Well, because dragonflies and damselflies tend to emerge in large numbers at certain times, that means that their mating as well occurs usually uh, at specific times. And often it's shortly after they emerge, like not that long after they emerge, that they start to either have courtship, like they have any jewel wings, or they just mate in a little more random fashion. But um, I don't know if there's actually a trigger uh, for that behavior. Although I think there are certain conditions that would not be conducive, of course, to mating. High winds, for example, would make it very difficult to lay eggs. And so I imagine there's a certain element of, uh, of wind factor involved. And uh, also to conditions like rain and so on. If it's raining most, especially heavily, dragonflies go to sh seek shelter. Some perch on tree trunks, some perch under branches but they tend to get out of the, of the, so I think there are environmental factors that uh, stop the uh, mating process, but um, I think no more is just uh, good conditions and that can happen, I think, fairly soon after they emerge. 
or it may take a little bit longer. But often too, you'll find that there are extended periods. Uh, but as you said, as, as the, the uh, not mysterious author of the question, but the um, whatever the term you were used you was, um, um, uh, they can happen, I think, in a short period of time too. Okay, great. And we have uh, four more questions and then I think we'll be done. Um, so Denise is asking, do some dragonflies overwinter? Well, they all mostly overwinter uh, in the eggs, like in the nymph stage in the water. As, as far as adults go, no, no, none overwinter. They, they would not be able to survive sub-zero temperatures. But down in the water, uh, when it's four degrees Celsius, for example, the nymphs are quite alive and they overwinter, but in the adult stage, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, question. and yeah, Bruce is asking, what is the life expectancy of the adult dragonfly and damselfly? Well, um, the longest lived would be the migratory common green darner. And I, I don't know offhand if it's even a full year, but if you include the nymph stage, of course, then that's a whole year guarantee even for small damselflies. And maybe a year in the nymph stage, and then maybe several weeks to a month or so in the adult stage. Um, but uh, unlike some insects that have not got mouth parts that cannot uh, eat as adults, like mayflies, for example, uh, dragonflies can live for extended times because they are eating. But as they're flying around, uh, the wings wear, and uh, as the wings wear more and more, then of course they can't fly. And they're also prone to being caught by birds. Uh, certain flycatchers love eating dragonflies, things like great crested flycatcher. Uh, swallows like purple martins eat dragonflies as well. And certainly the, the world of blackbirds out there uh, searching for the emerging dragonflies. But in terms of total lifespan, common green, green darner, I think would be one of the longest. Uh, some of the gliders, there's things called, species called wandering gliders that occur up here sometimes. They're known to travel across the ocean, uh, which is a remarkable feat for a dragonfly. And uh, I suspect that they are many months, but I, I don't know offhand what the total world record is for longevity of a dragonfly. <laughs> All right, and one more specifically about dragonflies and then one more about you. Um, so do dragonflies or damselflies have hearing or sensitivity to vibration? Oh, good question. Uh, certainly not hearing, but as far as I know, uh, to vibration, they tend to be visual hunters. Now in the water, it's possible as a nymph stage that vibrations could signify something moving toward them. So that's possible. But in terms of adult dragonflies, uh, as far as I know, their main sense is visual and they're visual hunters and they don't use olfactory or auditory cues uh, to find their prey. Okay, great. And then we are going to end on basically an introduction from you. We're doing it at the very end. Sheila's asking, what is your last name and a bit about your background? We didn't share too, too much other than your, your job title and your, and your name. <laughs> a bit about background? Um, yeah, maybe about your qualifications, I guess, or personal, a little bit of uh, how you came well, to be. Well, I'm, I'm still teaching at Carleton University. It's been 30 years now, I think, or more. Yeah, maybe 32, 33 years teaching courses on natural history and ornithology there. Um, I have authored a few books, I think 14 in total with photographs of my own. Um, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, my, my, my life partner, Britt, is behind me whispering, Nature by Runs. Yeah, I've got a, uh, what's it called, the website? Facebook, sorry, I'm such a Luddite. A Facebook page called Nature by Runts. That's got a pretty big following. And I post articles regularly there with photographs, but I had a, an injury. I don't know if you have seen my arm, but uh, I had an accident that's, I have lost the use of my right hand, uh, but it's supposed to, after this neurosurgeons worked on, it's supposed to come back with nine months to a year from now. 
And so I'm not posting as regularly while I'm in recovery stage, but it's still a site where I try to post as often as possible. And being Earth Day, maybe after we're done here, I'll, I'll try to post something on, on, on that. But uh, yeah, so I have that. And what else is there? What's that other thing called? Instagram. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> Britta obviously is the brains behind the social media. I'm not, but uh, <laughs> she's got me on an Insta Instagram site too. And uh, yeah, anyway, and, and we're hoping to have nature tours in the future once I retire from the university and um, yeah, things ahead like that. But uh, yeah, so, uh, and you know, I, I love photography and, and with this darn, I got a brace on, so I can't bend my elbow, but I can't quite reach the shutter on the camera. So it's a real pain, quite literally, trying to take photographs now. And I'm frustrated because here we have spring and the wildflowers are out and, you know, butterflies are out and, and I want to be out more and get more photographs of them. My goal is to photograph everything. And of course that's impossible. And my goal is to learn the name of everything. And that's impossible too. Um, but, you know, that's the beauty of looking at nature, whether it's dragonflies and damselflies or sedges or anything, hoverflies. Um, you know, you spend a lifetime, you'll never learn very much, uh, but you'll learn to enjoy nature so much more because you can put names on some of the characters you're meeting out there. And, and now there's such a, you know, wealth, a litany of, of books on natural history. You know, one on hoverflies came out, flowerflies, uh, was it last year? A superb book that let you identify these beautiful uh, insects that often look like bees or wasps. And, you know, there's more dragonfly books coming out of regional areas and sedges and mosses. And wow, what a world we have. And I and, uh, just hope we can preserve it. And, and, you know, thanks to the land trust and other land trusts, we have a hope of retaining what we've got for the future because so much of it is vanishing and it's, it's heartbreaking to see, you know, move back to our arm prior for being many years away and seeing, uh, houses being spread all across the landscape where once forest stood and streams where I walked as a boy, they're gone now. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's so important to have land trust and I hope, you know, the viewers of this, uh, support the uh, Oak Ridge land, uh, sorry, Oak Ridge Moraine land trust and other uh, future endeavors too. Well, thank you so much for that. It's, it's true. What we do is, so, so important and we do have a really supportive community here. So thank you everyone who has been watching all of our webinars um, as well as people that are new tonight. And Bruce just wanted to let you know that his camera is voice activated. So, you know, you could always look into that for this season. I can't even get my computer voice activated. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just a Luddite. <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, that is, those are all of our questions in the chat box. We had lots of compliments for you. Karen already found Nature by Runs. So uh, thank you for pointing us to that. And uh, I think so everyone really appreciated your presentation. Great. My pleasure. <laughs> All right, and we'll see you again for mammals uh, in May. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Looking forward to that. All right. Thank you, everybody. We're signing off. Okay. Good night, all. Good night. Happy Earth Day. Bye now. Happy Earth Day. Bye-bye.